do trust You. Lord, we trust You with our very lives. We who are Your people, God, we, we come together to sing truths such as these to remind ourselves that we ought not to trust in any other thing. Lord, um, it's all folly. It's all vanity. It's all a striving after the wind. But trusting in You, that is the house that is built upon the rock that will weather the storm in its season. And so, Lord, we call that to mind this morning. God, give us grace to trust in You in, in new ways. Lord, let us trust in You in, in, a, in, a, in a deeper way. Let it be that new truths pop out to us and reveal to us ways that we have not trusted in You. God, we recognize that every sin is somehow not believing something about you and your character, not holding to your promises. And so, Lord, we, we come together today to be reminded of the truths of your word so that we can trust in you more. Lord, help us to do that. God, I trust in you that, that this message that, that has been prepared from your word is exactly what your people need to hear today, for better or for worse. It's the message that I needed to hear this week. And I still need to hear. And I'm not exempt from this. So Lord, would, would You open our ears and our eyes, God, open our ears to hear these truths, that they would go from our head to our heart level, that they would be a conviction that we can't shake, that they would be a conviction that we, we have no choice but to want to live from this week. Open our eyes, God, to see these truths in Your Word that we would behold the glory and majesty of God in your nature as revealed in your word. And Lord, as we pray these things, we, we pray with utter dependence upon your spirit to do this work. Spirit, would you come and apply these truths to our hearts? And would you give us the, the strength, the, the fortitude to continue to obey as we go out from here? Not leaving here unchanged, but changed and, and ready to continue changing more into the image of the beloved Son. Lord, please, <laughs> that is our plea this morning. Would you do that work? Would you be pleased to do that? And God, as we always pray, every single Sunday, Sunday in and Sunday out, if there's anybody here that, that has yet to trust in you for the salvation of their soul for the first time, would you, would you do that work today? Again, by your Spirit. We need your Spirit. Lord, help us. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, church, let's, uh, let's stay standing for the reading of God's Word this morning. We are in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're at the, the end of this chapter, and we're going to be reading from verses 38 all the way through 48. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, it will be on the screens for you this morning. Let's read. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You may be seated. Hey guys, good morning. I always start with good morning. 
And uh, I just thought, let's switch it up. So hey guys is what we went with this morning. We might go to a howdy next week. I don't know. Uh, We'll see. Time will tell. But happy Sunday. Happy Lord's Day. That's what we gather for. We gather uh, in honor of the Lord Jesus who was resurrected on a Sunday and his subsequent apostles then began to meet on Sundays. The Sabbath was then moved to Sunday. And so we gather on Sundays. Happy Sunday. Happy Lord's Day. My name is Max Monahan. If I don't know you, would love to get to know you. Uh, I'm the pastor here, and I consider that a great honor and privilege, one that I do not take lightly. Um, and I thank you, uh, those of you who do call this place your home, the Shepherd's Church, your ho- home, for entrusting your soul to my care uh, under the watchful eye of our Lord, of course. Now this morning we get into a subject that Matthew really uh, delves into quite a bit. Uh, We'll see it in weeks to come as well. But this is the subject of how believers are to respond to adversity. Specifically, uh, with regard to persecution, that's a theme that he lays out time and time again. We first talked about it back in the Beatitudes at the beginning of chapter 5, and that was all about how the Christian will be, will be blessed for living, or excuse me, for having been persecuted. There's a blessing that comes with being persecuted for the name of Christ. But the question we see Jesus answering in that vein today is, how should a child of God respond to the evil they experience in the world? And the short answer is this, they have to endure it. If we were to take a look at church history, we'd hear story after story of Christians enduring evils that if we were honest with ourselves, we don't even have a frame of reference for in our modern context. And while they endured the unthinkable, they held fast to their hope in the Lord even unto death. I was researching this uh, subject this past week and was just calling to mind uh, the dying words of many of the uh, saints of old and one such one was uh, Ignatius, the great bishop of Antioch. He, he followed after Peter, the apostle Peter, and he, according to Fox's book of martyrs, dissuaded his compatriots from coming to his rescue when he was facing death. And he said the following, Now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. What a way to embrace the evil he was facing. The author continues, and even when he was sentenced to be thrown to the beasts, he spoke when he heard the lions roaring, saying, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. Far from pre- pleading to be saved from his fate, Ignatius embraced his brutal end, considering it a glory in and of itself to suffer for Christ. I think also of the 26 martyrs of Nagasaki, Japan. After Catholicism had broken into Japan and taken root heavily there, the uh, daimyo at the time, Toyotami Hideyoshi, arrested 26 people, some of whom were missionaries, but 17 were Japanese, including three young boys. They were arrested and tortured and paraded from Kyoto to Nagasaki, where they were led to 26 crosses prepared for them at the top of a hill that looked out over the city. It was there that two young boys, one 12 and one 13, after already enduring the worst up to that point, according to the story, said, show me to my cross, with the other then repeating him. What a tremendous story of faith. That's how you respond to evil against you. That's how you respond to persecution. And as we'll see today, all of that is rooted, number one, in the fact that we are following the Son, Jesus who underwent much of what we ourselves will have to face. And number two, that is how we are to respond as children of God the Father. And that's the title of our message today. Like father, like sons. Like father, like sons. How the Father will respond to evil is how we ought to respond as his children. 
Now, if you're just now joining us, we're in the the Gospel of Matthew, a glorious book, the first book of the New Testament. Matthew was a a tax collector, something that we will read about today. He was also an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of his 12 disciples, uh, one of his 12 very closest people in his life on earth. And he he wrote this book recording the words and uh, history of Jesus' life on earth in order to convince Jewish Christians from their scriptures that this is in fact the Messiah that they had been waiting for. He is the King of Kings that they were waiting for all along. Their scriptures pointed to him. And we're in a section in Matthew's gospel called the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus, he, he climbed the top of a hill and he, he began to preach and, and what he's preaching on are the ethics of this kingdom that this king is rolling out. And within these ethics, we get this section that we're in right now, all about misunderstandings that they had from those same scriptures, misunderstandings of the Jewish law. We would call that the first five books of the Old Testament. And Jesus is straightening out these misunderstandings, and and one such misunderstanding was the misunderstanding of murder, the commandment, do not murder, you shall not murder. Jesus said to stop shy of that, to say you, you do everything up to murder, is not saying that you're obeying that command. In fact, you can't be angry with somebody else. You can't hate somebody else. That qualifies for murder in the kingdom of God. He talked about adultery. Adultery isn't just cheating on someone you're married to. No, no, no. Adultery is, is lust in your heart. If you, if you look at a woman with lustful intent, that's adultery. If you divorce with the intention of being with somebody else, that is also adultery. We talked about oaths, and now here we are in our last section within that section, and here's our guiding idea for the morning. Children of God must respond to evil, not like the world would, but according to their parentage. Children of God, you as children of God, you're not called to act like they do when they experience evils. You're a child of God. You respond like your father would. Believer, you have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, adopted into the household of God. You are wearing a different name on the back of your jersey. You are representing him, and you are called to act like it. Our text breaks down in two ways. There are two ways we're called to react in the face of evil as believers. And along with each of those paths of response, we'll see Jesus' Jesus' correction to the misunderstanding. And we'll see four different case studies for each that will elaborate on that response. Did I give you enough time to write that? That was a, okay, great, great. Some people said yes. Here's our first point. Don't retaliate, endure evil. How do you respond? Don't retaliate. Rather, endure evil. And we see that in verses 38 through 42, that first paragraph. How should you respond? Don't retaliate, rather, endure evil. And here's the correction that Jesus is going to make. This is a sub point, if you will. The correction to the misunderstanding. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, as we've seen uh, week after week, in certain instances, the misunderstanding lies in uh, a, a faulty interpretation of what they were Uh, what God was trying to communicate in the law. Other times, it it was kind of an amalgamation of of a couple of different laws. It wasn't quite a direct quotation, but in this case, it is, which is to say Jesus is taking something straight from the Old Testament. That's what he's speaking into. The people didn't, didn't have it misquoted. They hadn't altered the wording. They had it down verbatim. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So how then was there a misunderstanding? Well, the misunderstanding for this one lies in how they were applying this verse to their lives. You may or may not remember we talked about what we are to do with the law at the beginning of this section about a month ago in light of Jesus coming to fulfill them. We recognize that Jesus, he's not doing away with the Old Testament law, right? He's here to fulfill it. Rather, our relationship to the law has changed. 
We see it through Jesus now. And so we respond differently. The law is still good, but it doesn't have the same application for us because of him. If you weren't here or you don't remember, no problem. Allow me to elaborate. Theologians have historically put the commandments of God's law into three categories. Moral, civil, and ceremonial. We're going to go to class for just a second here, but I promise it'll be worth it. Moral is always binding, okay? This refers to doing what is righteous. No matter what era of human history, this is always applicable because it's all about doing what God would have us do always. Okay, that's the moral law. Instances of civil law reflect laws that were established in order to have the ideal society on earth in order to make Israel's neighbors look at them and say, whoa, that's different over there. The way you guys treat your women, the way you guys treat your slaves, that's different. I want to go over there. Israel's got it going on. It showed God's nature, in other words, through his people. His holiness was displayed in them being set apart with their laws, their civil laws, which would draw others to come and see him. We could argue over whether those civil laws are good for America, but by and large, what we should do with these is find the underlying principle and then apply them to our lives, respectively. Finally, there's the ceremonial. Think priests, cleanness, sacrifices, temple, offerings, worship. In light of these, we do a couple of things. We praise God as we remember that he is so holy. So holy, in fact, that the Israelites had to adhere to all of these in order to have his glory, not even his actual presence, but just his glory manifested in their midst. And also, we are so sinful We need lots of sacrifices and rituals in order for that to occur. And number three, Jesus paid for all of that. Jesus fulfilled all the sacrifices, no more needed. He was the once for all sacrifice, our never ending high priest. We look at Jesus. That's what we do with the ceremonial law. So moral, civil, ceremonial, really oversimplifying when I say this, but maybe it'll be helpful, a little rhyme. Moral is for all of us. Civil means we must adjust. Ceremonial points to Jesus, okay? Moral is for all of us. Civil means we must adjust. Ceremonial points to Jesus. In light of that, let's consider the context of the passages that Jesus is quoting because this appears in three different places and let's determine which one it fits into. We've got three texts. We're going to begin with Exodus, Exodus 21, 22 through 25, and these will be on the screens, so you don't have to hurry to write them down, Leviticus 24, 17 through 20, and Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. Looking at Exodus, we read these words, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So what's happening here? Okay, we've got two men fighting. And in the event of that, or excuse me, two men are fighting, and in in that circumstance, a pregnant woman, she gets caught in the middle, and in the event that the baby is harmed, whatever happened to the baby shall be repaid on the offender, which is an excellent passage for the record to say that uh, unborn life is still life, right? If you're going to execute the same punishment upon that person, Well, what about Leviticus? Leviticus 24, 17 through 20. We read these words. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good. Life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. So similar situation, only now we're talking about neighbors and an injury is being suffered and then repaid upon the offender. Well, what about Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. 
A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The, du- the judges shall inquire diligently. And if the witness is a false witness and accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And so here, slightly different circumstance. We have a courtroom drama playing out. And at the end, if it's found out that somebody is being wrongfully accused, the person who tried to have that punishment inflicted upon the other will receive that punishment. It will receive back the exact same one. You accuse me of something that would have earned me 25 to life. Now you're getting 25 to life. That kind of deal. So then which category do these passages that Jesus has directly quoted fit into? It might seem like moral. There's obviously some kind of uh, you know, good and bad, right and wrong stuff going on. It has to do with people doing things wrong. It might seem like ceremonial. There was some priest talk in there. We heard that. But these quotes actually fit best within the civil law. They are legal rulings applied at the state level in an effort to uphold justice. And so what are we to do with it? Well, it's not immediately take them and directly apply them to our lives. That's what we're to do with it. Or to not do, rather. Instead, we ought to decide what the underlying principle is first. In this case, far from these being a blanket statement about revenge, these are actually about restitution. It's about, it's about um, justice. And if we really wanted to get into it, it's also specifically limiting what kind of payment would be made, what kind of punishment would be inflicted. It was explicitly proportionate to the offense. It wasn't um, an eye for an eye and a limb. It was an eye for an eye and that's it. It was really about making a wrong right and at the civil level. Meaning this is a law put in place to take care of people to protect them so that justice would be upheld in society. Does that make sense? This wasn't there so that you could get revenge on your enemy at all. But that's how they were taking it. In other words, this is a great law at the state level. It makes for a just society. But what Jesus is saying here is that on a personal level, that was never the point. And as my people in my kingdom, that will never be the point. No, for his people, he calls them to not resist the one who is evil, the evildoer. But you might say, well, I can't can't stand up for injustice. I can't defend myself? Is Jesus saying, I can't do that? No, that's, that's not what he's getting at. What this resisting evil looks like, what Jesus is getting at, is that, is that toil that we can engage in to get back at others for things that have happened to us. It's fighting back against personal harm, being personally defrauded. And it's not to say that we want those things to happen to us either, but the point is when your witness is on the line, are you more into defending yourself, protecting your stuff, or preserving your reputation? Or are you concerned with the message that it sends the world about Jesus? Because you are his ambassador, church. Whether you like it or not, whether you're a good one or not, when people look at your life, they will make the connection you equal Christian. And if you also equal self-centered, then Christian equals hypocrite. Christianity equals sham. And even worse, Jesus equals phony, fake, not worth trusting in. So what does that look like for us, though? How do we see this play out? Well, thankfully, Jesus provides us with four case studies. And we'll look at them individually. In his gracious provision, he has given us these, a fully comprehensive picture of how we ought to respond. We're not to resist evil. Okay, well, what happens if somebody actually causes me physical harm? And what if the court of law is actually on my side in my revenge-seeking 
I can't apply eye for an eye then. Correct. To go back to our main point, don't retaliate, but endure evil even when smacked. Even when you get smacked. Don't return evil for evil. We read in verse 39b, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. The illustration we get here is one of physical harm, to be sure. But in that historical context, it actually goes beyond that. It was a direct insult to slap somebody across the face. I'm sure that comes as no surprise to you all. You would feel the same way. But back then, it was specific and even punishable in the court of law. You had called somebody's honor to the mat. And in this case, Jesus is talking not just about a regular slap to the face, okay? But assuming the person was right-handed, in order to slap somebody across the right cheek, it had to be a, a backhand slap. Meaning this was a nonverbal assault upon a person's pride of the most disrespectful variety. And what Jesus is saying here is, even in this instance, even when you've been completely disrespected, even when you have that feeling like your pride is under attack and you have to do something about it, when your gut response is to want to rise up and to tear the other person apart limb for limb, and legally, you're actually allowed to take action, the Christian is called to something godlier, something harder to not retaliate. Makarios the Great, one of the desert fathers, uh, he was a guy following the, the reign of um, Constantine in Rome. As you might expect, it became a cultural Christianity in there. And so what happened is you had a lot of people floating around who weren't really Christians. And so we had these, this group of, uh, they call them ascetics, um, guys who were committed to asceticism, which is living a life set apart. They went off into the desert. They're like, this isn't real Christianity. We're going to go live in the desert. Macarius was one of them. And so he goes into the desert and he's doing all these wild uh, kind of things. Guys in this time period would do all kinds of things to deny themselves really outrageous stuff. But what he did is particularly interesting to us. And one writer details it very well. He writes, on one occasion, Macarius was accused of seducing a young woman which ruined both her and his reputation. Though the accusation was false, Macarius refused to defend himself. Instead, he provided for her needs, which gave the impression that he was in fact guilty. Sometime later, the truth came out, thus vindicating Macarius. But Macarius fled in order to avoid the praise he was about to receive." End quote. Now that's an extreme example. I'm not saying you can't defend yourself if you're being falsely accused. I'm not here to say that at all. This guy and all the desert fathers were overly zealous in many ways. But if we really consider our response being a reflection of Christ, our response might be a little bit more in line with this. Not hurrying to defend ourselves. We might think twice before launching a counterattack, physical, verbal, or otherwise. But what if the attack is more pointed than that? What if it's in order to take something that belongs to you? Don't retaliate, but endure evil even when swindled. Even when swindled. We read in our verse 40, And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. In order to understand this, we should probably figure out what a tunic and a cloak are. Uh, The tunic was like your undergarment back then. It was like kind of a a fabric poncho. Uh, It was your shirt and your pants, and it would be cinched at the waist with a belt. And then the cloak was like the overcoat. It had sleeves, it was far more expensive, and for the poor, it often served as the thing that kept you warm at night as you slept. The tunic could be given in pledge for a debt that was owed, something of collateral in the event that you can't pay your debt. But there were laws in the Old Testament of the civil variety, if you wanted to know, that prevented a person from demanding the cloak also. That would have been seen as inhumane and cruel, and as such, no person could demand that of you. But what Jesus is saying here is, even if somebody takes you to court, and they're demanding the literal shirt off your back, let's say even falsely, 
Let's say you did everything by the book, but they're still gunning for you. Rather than getting all up in arms about it, you are to say with humility, hey, that's okay. No love lost. In fact, I would willingly give you even the part that's protected by law rather than retaliate. This isn't saying you can't participate in lawsuits. This has been taken out of context to say that they are there for a purpose, but it's saying I'd actually sooner be defrauded than respond to their sin by sinning myself. I will not retaliate. But hey, maybe you're the type that's not phased by public insults. Maybe you can be struck across the face and, and be just fine. Maybe you'd even be okay if they took you to court and tried to rob you blind. But what about if somebody forced you to do something you didn't want to do? Well, we would say, don't retaliate, but endure evil even when subjected. Even when subjected. We read in verse 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile Go with him two miles. Now what Jesus is speaking to here is a situation called Angar Yuo. Angar Yuo was the right of a Roman soldier to make you carry his equipment. We only have one occurrence outside of its use here in the New Testament and it was used of Simon of Cyrene who was commanded to carry Jesus' cross. The Jewish Christian, remember, living under Roman rule would be legally obligated to submit to this, but the law forbade them going beyond one mile under their burdens. And so what Jesus is saying here, in effect, is much like what he's been saying in the other two illustrations. My people aren't supposed to be looking to the laws to determine how they ought to act. Christian behavior is determined by grace, fueled by the grace that you yourself have received. You don't stop at the law, you go beyond it. I don't know if it's in my notes here, uh, but I just want to preface this little illustration by saying I'm not trying to make myself a hero here, okay? And maybe that's an odd way to start it, but um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in this situation, not just as a pastor, I haven't been a pastor that long, right? But I've been doing ministry for some time longer. Um, How many times I've poured myself out to the end. And I'm at the end of a long day. Uh, Lately, it's after my son goes down and I'm just, I'm ready to curl up on the couch with my wife. Frankly, I'm just ready to expire. (laughs) And that's when the phone rings or there's a knock at the door. And hear me when I say this, I'm not saying this to dissuade any of you from reaching out in your moment of need. I know my job doesn't always fit within office hours and I truly love what I do. Some of my favorite parts of ministry are these ones that I'm about to describe. And number two, I'm not trying to say I excel in this category. On the contrary, when uh, that text comes in that says, hey, I hate to bother you, but are you available tonight? It's important. When that knock comes at the door, when the phone rings, there's a real pull for me to want to say, Lord, I've got nothing left. I went the mile. Honestly, sometimes I feel like I've already gone the two. And he's saying, not audibly, but through these words here, yeah, I'm actually going to need you to go three today. But the good news is I'm also going to supply the strength you need for it by my Spirit Oh yeah, and you'll be glad that you did. And I say all that to say that we find ourselves in these positions often where it's like, God, I already did everything. I already reached out to them to ask them for forgiveness. I shouldn't have to reach out again. But it's on you, Christian. It's not about where the law stops. It's about where our job as His people stops. But what about this one? Even when we are scammed. Even when we are scammed. We read in verse 42, Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. I say, even when scammed, not to say that that's for sure what's happening here, but rather to speak to our heart place. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're prone to want to say, they're just trying to scam me. And that's what this is pushing back against. Now, does that mean that you have to give to every single person you see with a cardboard sign? 
I am not going to keep that upon you, church. Depending on where you live or where you're going, you might very well drain your bank account by the time that you arrive at your destination, right? In the words of St. Augustine, the call is to give to him who asks, not to give everything to him who asks. And so the call is to live in light of being his, not to fall back on the fact that they're probably just scamming you. Or even, dare I say, the fact that you might be enabling their um, state, their addiction, whatever it may be, by lending to them. I think one commentator put it well when he said, it is for each disciple to work out for themselves how this principle can most responsibly be applied to the issue of giving and lending in the different circumstances in which we find ourselves, end quote. I say that to say, I'm not saying you need to give to every single person with the cardboard sign. The goal isn't here to put a rule on how many or who you can give to or under what circumstances. The point, rather, is to push back against the social norms, the wickedness of our flesh and the ways of the world, and instead, whether it's evil for sure and you know that they're going to spend it on beer or just perceived evil toward us, you endure it. And you do what the kingdom of God says to do. I'm going to move on in just a moment, but let me just tell you this brief story. Um, Prior to being a pastor, I worked in restaurants. Anybody work in restaurants before? Nice, nice. Y'all probably know how to treat people in restaurants, all right? Amen? And all my people in restaurants said amen. Uh, But I used to work in restaurants. That's where I met my wife. We worked in a restaurant together. And we worked for a guy who uh, was a managing partner, you know, so uh, the cream of the crop in the place, right? The the top of the food chain. But the thing that made this guy special and made you really want to work hard for him is he would also bust the tables, he was running the trash to the curb. He was, uh, you know, doing all the dirty jobs that nobody wanted to do. And the thing about that is when you see your leader doing that, you're like, uh, yeah, I should probably be doing that. It makes you want to work harder when you see him doing even the lowliest of tasks. And at the end of the day, Jesus is not calling you to some insane standard that he himself wouldn't do. We just walked through the, uh, the crucifixion account in gory detail last month. You know who got slapped across the face? They blindfolded him. They struck him and they said, prophesy, tell us who struck you. You know who was taken into court and accused? Luke 23, 10 through 11, the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. You know who was dragged before the people, even stripped of his garments? Matthew 27, 35, and when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. You know who, even though he knew their hearts didn't retaliate at all, who didn't lift a finger or raise his voice, who gave to the beggar, who gave and didn't refuse it? Jesus and who really bore burdens up to and beyond the maximum one mile? How about the one who bore the full wrath of God, the complete punishment reserved for the sins of the world upon his shoulders? How about bearing that cross literally as he marched to his death as much as his human body was able to do so near to death? And then again, on the cross, the full weight of our sins, the full punishment that we deserve, that's what our Savior did. And he did that so that you can do these things. He did that to free you up to go and do likewise. And there may come a day when you have to bear an actual cross, like our introduction said. But it's likely that your version of what's expected in this text, it's a whole lot easier, a whole lot smaller than that, a smaller ask. And what I'm telling you is, by his Holy Spirit, you can He has freed the believer up to endure evil, to withstand it, not to condone it, but to weather it without responding with retaliation. And why? Because that's what he did for you. Now all of that is fine, you might say. I can endure evil. I can do the thing. But it doesn't mean I'm going to like it. And I'm certainly not going to like the person who did it to me. Let's turn to our second point. 
don't discriminate, love enemies. Don't retaliate, endure evil, don't discriminate, love your enemies. Listen, I agree. It is a good and noble thing to endure evil. It may be that it looks like persecution unto death. In the words of many martyrs of church history, they truly give us life. But there's one type of final words that I I really think we should call to mind. They're not the ones where somebody showed faith in the midst of overwhelming odds, although those are awesome. No, the best ones are the ones where they're staring death in the face and rather than cursing their enemies, rather than just looking to heaven at their own reward and rejoicing over their lot, they consider the spiritual state of their oppressors. Those are the best ones. And to that end, I'd call to mind the dying words of William Tyndale who for his commitment to biblical truth was executed by strangulation and then burnt at the stake by Henry VIII. His final words, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. The very first Christian martyr after Christ himself, Stephen, who was stoned to death, he's another great example. And his final words are pertinent to us, Acts 860 records them. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. We could look at the Lord himself who said amid his execution, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. You might be able to endure evil, but can you love the ones who committed against you? That's the question. Let's turn to our text, starting with our correction to their initial thinking on the subject. The correction we find in verses 43 through 45a, and they say this, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now we've got a lot there in those short three verses, but let's see if we can break it down. First, what were they hung up on? Well, apparently, some people had begun, probably the scribes and Pharisees, I mean, they certainly know how to hate, they had begun to twist some words of the law and led the people to believe, no, you really only need to love your neighbor. If somebody does you wrong, see verse 38, an eye for an eye, baby, go get them. But where were they getting that? Well, one place is Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, and we'll have this on the screens for you as well. Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, and that says this, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So that's clearly where it says to love your neighbor, right? That's obvious. But it doesn't exactly say, hate your enemy, does it? Well, it may be that they took the first part of that. The first verse in that section said, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. And maybe they decided from that, ah, but my enemy is not my brother. They're not being neighborly, ipso facto, they're they're not my neighbor. Don't have to love them. So that's one option, but what else? Well, weren't they called to wipe out all the neighboring nations? Remember that, the conquest narrative in in Joshua and Judges gets into it too? That seems pretty hateful. Well, maybe. It did say they were not to have pity on them, but then again, those were exceedingly wicked people. And also, little uh, hermeneutical pro tip here, uh, studying the Bible pro tip, That was an extremely specific moment in history. And what I mean by that is we don't go walking up to water and trying to part it with a staff, do we? We would acknowledge that some parts of this thing were supposed to happen back then and only back then, right? Now, it's not licensed to throw that whole thing out, but we should recognize that some things are prescriptive, meaning this is what you should do, you're prescribed to do. It's instruction on how we need to live, and some of them are descriptive. These are describing events that you can learn from. They're here to tell a story. And we have to do a little bit of work to determine how we are to live in light of that. Does that make sense? The conquest in the promised land, wiping out those neighboring nations, that's descriptive. 
Don't go up to Eldorado Hills and try to wipe out everybody who's not a Christian, okay? And we could get into other examples too. Malachi 1, 2 through 3, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. The point there isn't we should hate Esau ourselves. That's God's electing love. Definitely not calling us to, lo- uh, to hate people. We could get into Psalm 139 where David is bearing his soul to God saying, don't I hate those who hate you? Don't I loathe those who rise up against you? The point is, there, it, that, that's his, an imprecatory prayer. That's also not prescriptive. That's him showing his zeal for God. The point is you are never called to hate anyone regardless of what they do to you. Instead, you are to love those who persecute you and pray for them. How could you exemplify the absolute epitome of love toward them? Go before God and plead on their behalf that he would open their eyes. When was the last time somebody cut you off on the road and you said, Lord, I don't know if that person is yours, but if they're not yours, if they're all up in arms, they're all angry because they're living in sin and they don't know the love of a merciful God, would you save them? Would you open their eyes to see you? Would you replace their anger with exaltation? Would you replace their rebellion with rejoicing as you have done for me? Lord, let them be yours. I think about politicians. It's so easy to hate politicians. After all, we would have no trouble saying that the policies that they enact are evil, right? When was the last time you prayed for politicians you don't like? When was the last time you saw the evil laws being passed or heard of Christians being stripped of their rights across the globe and you dropped to your knees about it and said, change the ones that are doing that? It's easy yelling at your newsfeed. It's harder praying against the anger in your heart and praying on their behalf. Yet even when they persecute you, you as a representative of Christ, you should be praying for them. It makes you wonder, the Apostle Paul used to persecute the church, right? He dragged them out of their homes. He put them on trial for their lives. How many of his victims prayed for him? Certainly the Lord had it in his plan all along to use the self-proclaimed chief of sinners for his purposes, but was he pleased to do so in response to the prayers of his people? When Stephen was being stoned, when the Jews laid their coats at a young Paul's feet so that they could engage in the stoning, was Stephen praying for Paul specifically? God, give us that kind of faith into what end that we might be called sons of of our Father in heaven. That's what being his children looks like. That's what shows that you are his children. But let's zoom in a bit. Let's look at the case studies for this section. What does that really look like? We get another four case studies, four object lessons, and they're around four different persons or types of people, starting with the Father himself. Don't discriminate, but rather love your enemies like your Father. And I recognize that the grammar can be confusing there. I don't mean to say love enemies such as your father. I mean to say love your enemies like your father does. We continue by reading verse 45b. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. This verse here gets into what has been historically known as the doctrine of common grace. Common grace, according to one definition, refers to God's impartation of grace to both unbelievers and believers alike. Another definition explains common grace is that goodness of God to all men in sending rain, providing food, and sustaining every breath. Have you ever noticed, church, that there are things that we all experience, whether we believe in Jesus or not, such as the weather? That's common grace. God has seen fit to provide food and shelter even to people who reject him, common grace. God, as it is, provides the very breath in the lungs of the unbeliever that they use to spew insults at him, common grace. He provides the atheist the strength in their body that they use to lash out in a fury of keyboard clicks online. In the words of Luke 6.35, a parallel passage to this one, Luke 6.35 But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. Why? For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. 
Just as we are called to emulate the Son in our previous point, we are called to emulate our Father in heaven in his earthly care for others. He was kind. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. He doesn't discriminate in an earthly sense. I say in an earthly sense because truly not everyone will experience grace in an eternal sense as not all will be saved, which brings us to the big brother of common grace, the doctrine of special grace, also known as saving grace. And we would do well to acknowledge these doctrines because for the unbeliever experiencing common grace in the here and now, that's where it ends. That's as good as it gets. Because whatever good they have in this life will be stripped of them upon death, at which point they will experience life removed from such common grace. And because of that, We ought to labor in the preaching of the gospel purely in hopes that they will experience God's special grace, his saving grace. We don't know if it will work. That's God's territory. But we know this is how he works through us. And so we shoot our shot, so to speak. We strive loving them in this life by ministering to them with the life to come in mind because even our Father loves them in this life even while he will not overlook their cosmic rebellion in the life to come. We love them best in the here and now by being concerned for their later and not yet. But what else? We love like our Father, but we also love unlike the hypocrite. Unlike the hypocrite. Jesus brings in some real-world examples for this one and the next, and to us today, it may be a little surprising. We read these words in verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? To go back to that parallel passage in Luke 6, those who are sons of God, those who are his children, they look forward to a reward. Praise God. And they who look forward to a reward by acting in keeping with this text, which is to say they love their enemies, thus if you don't love your enemies, what reward could you possibly have? If you discriminate on who you're going to love, if you treat, treat it like you're ordering off a menu, yeah, I'll take one of those, but not, not that one over there, and I'll do one of those as well. That's not what your father does with people. Again, in this life. And you shouldn't either. But even beyond the positive example of God the Father, we get the negative example of the tax collector. Now I have no doubt, many of you have frustrations at tax times, okay? It's a surprise to us all. We budget and we plan, and then still, somehow, it's a different number. Uh, Maybe for me. I'm sure there's some people here who are not that way, who are better at math. I'm going to stop talking now before I embarrass myself further. But let me stop you right now if you have those frustrations and say this is a little bit different of a context. When we're talking about tax collectors, back in the New Testament times, we're talking about Jewish people who had essentially betrayed their Jewish brethren by collecting taxes from them on behalf of the Roman government. And what they would do is they would actually take an extra portion. They would skim some off the top. So they would give the right number to the Roman government, but they got to take whatever else they wanted to. And so they were crooks, betraying their own people for their own sordid gain. And just as an aside, this is one of those instances where we say, yeah, God, you wrote this book. Because why would Matthew, the tax collector, use tax collectors as such a terrible example if God didn't write this book? In any event, what we have here is a group of people who were Jewish by birth. They were supposed to be loyal to their fellow Jews, and yet they served the Roman government. They served their oppressors. And they got rich off the misfortune of their own people. In other words, they were supposed to be with us, but they actually aren't. They forsook their spiritual heritage in favor of personal gain. That's why I call them hypocrites. And tell me we don't see people like this in our day. There may be some people in this very room with us. They'll happily be nice to the Christian who is all cleaned up, who fits their mold for how people are supposed to live. That's easy. But when it comes to people they don't want to associate with, they'd be the ones that cross the street in the parable of the Good Samaritan. For this person, they're acting just like the tax collector, the one who plays favorites, who has the spiritual pedigree supposedly to enter the kingdom, yet no fruit to speak of, and as such should have no assurance of an eternal reward. To such person, 
they have their reward today. That money they skimmed off the top, that's all they're going to get. And if this is you in our modern context, if you're here today, perhaps you need to look at your life and determine for yourself whether you have this type of fruit, whether you are hypocritical or not, whether you love your enemies or not, because we're called to go beyond hypocrisy. We're called to be genuine. Let love be genuine, Romans says. We're called to love the unlovable. We're called to pursue them even as they may persecute us as if we're practicing for paradise. So that's the hypocrite. But what about the person who is full-blown outside the camp? What about the full-blown unbeliever? Well, we're called to love our enemies unlike they would also. We read in verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Unlike the Gentiles, you are called to greet people which is not just to shake their hand and say hello, it's to bring them in. But you're, you're called to greet people who would not be considered your brothers. And I think this deserves a little bit of explanation because uh, ethnically, most of us would be considered Gentiles, right? Gentile uh, means non-Jewish, a non-Jewish people, and most of us are not ethnically Jewish. And yet, we, we look at what Matthew is recording here with the words of Jesus, what he is, how he is aiming them under the direction of the Holy Spirit at a predominantly Jewish Christian audience at a time when Gentiles, uh, us, had yet to be grafted into the community of God's people. And so what he's largely talking about here is unbelievers. For in, they, in their day, it was those outside of the spiritual community of the Jews, those who were considered Gentiles, who were of the least inclusive variety. They were discriminatory. Similarly today, when the church is functioning as it should, the church is of the most inclusive variety and it is those outside the church who are the least inclusive. But that also deserves explanation. See, the world propagates inclusivity, right? We all know that. Tolerance, inclusivity, you know, all the things. What number am I on? They propagate it like it's the gold standard of human virtue, yet in actuality it falls woefully short. In the name of tolerance, indeed, they act much like the Gentiles of Jesus' day. They discriminate against us Christians in many cases and against, well, a lot of you, even more specifically if you're white and Christian and uh, male and straight. But I would also add that in some ways the unbelieving world does this better than us. Are we not prone to avoid the person that's not like us? I immediately think of the folks who display their unbelief externally. Like how about a homosexual couple? Like how about somebody who's in the the process of gender transformation? Are we willing to approach them and greet them? And I should mention, if you're taking your cues from the news rather than the Bible, you probably aren't. Because the news says us versus them. They're dumb. Look at the dumb thing that this political group did. The Bible, on the other hand, says no. Love them. Pray for them. Greet them. How about this? Invite them over for dinner. Minister to them on your terms, not theirs, that's key, and love them. It doesn't mean you condone that which God's word does not or you applaud sinful behavior, but if we were truly living this out, it's going to look different. It's going to be hard. It's going to be messy, but our king's kingdom, it's not supposed to look like ours. It's radically different. But if we do that well, if we love those who are hostile to God, who are different from us, not getting hung up on what the Jews of Jesus' day were often hung up on, which is becoming unclean themselves, That's why I advise doing it on your terms so that you don't put yourself in a situation to where you fall into sin. But if we do this, we'll actually be offering the true iteration of what the world is promising them. And if we're honest, they're over-promising and under-delivering on, namely love, acceptance, and Lord willing, their inclusion into a family, into his family, by repentance and belief in the gospel. So that's considering the negative examples We're not called to emulate, but we have one more case study and it gets back to what we've been saying all along. We are to love like his children. Love like the Father, your enemies. Love unlike 
the hypocrites, unlike the unbelievers, but love like his children should. We read, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is a summary of all of what we've been working through in chapter 5 since verse 3. If you look back on the Beatitudes, if you read that part about being salt and light, if you read the part about Christ coming to fulfill the law and about how we need a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees' righteousness, it all finds its climax, climax here in this verse. Now, the call isn't to throw the whole rule book out and do whatever you want, nor is it to be a pretty good person. Rather, the call for a child of God most high is to be like him, perfect. I don't think I need to tell you this, but this is a daunting call. And it should cause us to say, yeah, that's not me. I've tried to be perfect. I've failed time and time again. I can't even be called perfect by the world's standards, let alone God's standards. I don't let things go. I want to retaliate. Sometimes I do retaliate. And much more, those who wrong me, I don't love them. I don't bring them in. I can't do this. But as we've mentioned time and time again, that's the point. We will never attain to this standard But praise be to God where we had sinned against our heavenly father, our creator, where we had essentially said, I don't want to be your son. Our creator where he had, uh, where we had created enmity, where peace was supposed to dwell. God didn't treat us like his enemy. He loved us and that love took the form of the father sending his son down to earth to be perfect for us to measure up to this this standard so that we wouldn't have to, to die for us to clear our debts, to rise again, to apply that perfect record to our account so that the Father looks at us and sees the golden child, not the delinquent. And even after all that, he sends his spirit to work in our hearts to foster repentance, which is to say a desire to turn from our sin and instills faith, which is to say a belief that Jesus died to save us from it. And then after all that, that same Holy Spirit works in our hearts to cultivate that perfection in us, to make us adhere more to this terrifyingly daunting standard, not making us perfect altogether, but bit by bit perfecting us as we ourselves strive to be like our Father in heaven until we meet our God face to face. So no, we can't measure up to this standard. In this life, we will never be perfect as he is perfect, and yet he sees us as perfect because Jesus was perfect. And then he gives us his spirit so that we can press into that more and more with every passing day. We rest in knowing we'll not see perfection until we see him, but we'll shoot for it. Resting in Jesus' perfection credited to us praising him forever because boy we don't deserve it one bit and if that doesn't describe you today i can't know for sure but perhaps that work of the holy spirit i just described is happening in your heart right now and is cultivating a spirit of repentance and would that you in turn turn from your sin that you would repent that you would say god i acknowledge that i have sinned so greatly against you and i want to forsake this sin for the rest of my life and follow headlong after jesus christ letting him be the lord over my life not just the savior who saved me from the treachery of my sin but who also rules over my life that i submit to him for the rest of my days and that's it repentance and faith It's a free gift by God's grace alone. You don't deserve it. You could never earn it, yet he freely gives it. And if you have questions on that, as I always avail myself, I'll be by the the doors over there on your way out. I would love to chat with you about it. Uh, We'll also have people praying for you or ready to pray for you by the exits. And you don't just have to go there if you're an unbeliever looking to become a believer. You could go there just to share something you're happy about that the Lord is doing in your life and you can just praise the Lord together. They would be happy to do that. But church, let's, let's be like our God, shall we? Let's endure evil like the Son. Let's love like the Father and let's strive for that perfection that characterizes Him by the power of His Spirit until we see our Lord face to face. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, who is sufficient for these things? I echo the words of Paul. Who is sufficient for these things, Lord? Not one of us.
can measure up to the standard that you have set forth. Not one of us can be perfect like you are perfect. And yet we thank you for the enabling grace that you give, the ability to pursue it bit by bit more and more, a grace that we did not experience when all we experienced was your common grace, when we were still yet your enemies, Lord. We, we were striving after the wind. We were no more holier from one degree or from one day to the next than the day before. And yet you have given us the ability to press into these commandments, knowing all the while that we're never going to measure up to the standard, but we thank you because our King, our Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ himself, did it for us. Lord, give us the ability to trust in you in that way. Lord, let us often come to these texts and say, yeah, I can't do this, but, but someone did it for me. And in response to that, I can press into it all the more because he has also given me his spirit to enable me for the work. Lord, we pray that the rest of our time here would be pleasing in your sight, that it would be so worshipful and intentional, God, because you're worthy of it. We pray all these things in the the name of the one who makes it all possible, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, Jesus Christ himself. Amen.